Okay, thank you all for coming today. Uh, this is the ninth, I believe, speaker in, officially in our series, and uh, Dr. Jennifer Bates will introduce him in a moment. I just want to anticipate the last speaker of our series, which will be on April 11th at an unusual time, 2.30. Uh, that speaker's flying out that evening, so that's, that talk will be at 2.30 <coughs> afternoon. And that's Lloyd Gerson from the University of Toronto, probably the world's preeminent authority on Platonism. So I hope everybody who can will come on April 11th. So without further ado, Jennifer Bates will introduce our speaker for today. Hi, nice to see so many of you. I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Theodore George. Ted George, uh, he's just a wonderful person and a wonderful philosopher, and he's just done a wonderful job of uh, talking to my class. So he's going straight through four or five hours straight with no sign of fatigue. So keep at the questions at the end and see how long he lasts. Um, so <laughs> um, he is a uh, scholar of German idealism and hermeneutics in particular. He's uh, written on a whole variety of uh, scholars in the uh, figures in the, in the tradition. Uh, he has a book on Hegel called Tragedies of Spirit, Tracing Finitude in Hegel's Phenomenology. Uh, he is the editor of Epoche, which is uh, the long title of that journal, the uh, Epoche, a journal for the history of philosophy. Um, and he is also one of the organizer, or are you the main organizer for the Collegium? No, I'm a, now a former director. A former so director of the Collegium. No uh, many of our students go there. One of those, at least a couple of our students are going there this summer, so it's a really great, great thing um, to learn about. Um, and he is, of course, associate professor of philosophy at Texas A&M uh, University, where one of your former graduate student colleagues is. Uh, Brittany Leckie, and uh, she's doing wonderfully there, and she loves it there. So we should all encourage each other to go there. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass the torch over to um, Ted. Uh, he's talking on lost and profound in translation. Thank you. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm appreciative of the department for the invitation, and Jennifer in particular. Jennifer, as you probably know, came down to Texas A&M not too long ago, and we had a wonderful time, and she gave a wonderful address at a conference that we were hosting. And so it's very nice to be up here. Um, Duquesne, as you all know, is a really storied program in philosophy, and uh, although I know that, I, I haven't been on campus or been in the department much, and it's been really wonderful for me to be here. Going to Jennifer's class, too, the, the reputation is still golden. The students were really wonderful. It's a great discussion, very interesting. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, I am talking on the topic of translation. I think Jennifer, uh, especially her students, are probably going to know more about it than I do, but I'll try to say something. The title is Lost and Found in Translation, uh, but it's part of a larger project in the area of hermeneutics. And the larger project concerns uh, what I call the responsibility to understand. And uh, by that, I have in mind a number of different ethical and political considerations that um, uh, are brought into focus, above all by Gadamer's philosophical hermeneutics, but also by some more recent commentators or uh, figures who've developed philosophical hermeneutics beyond the context of Gadamer, especially probably Gunter Figal, who's uh, translated and other figures too, Vatimo and uh, Donatello di Cesare in Italy. So that's the, the broader project. In the first part of the book, I talk about issues that you might refer to more as ethical. Gadamer talks about them using Bububer's phrase as uh, issues that concern the relation of I and you, or I and thou. And then the second part of the book, I take up larger global questions. I uh, talk about the question of whether you can think hermeneutically about a global tradition. Uh, and then likewise, I talk about uh, the context of global or world literature, as Goethe called it. And then this paper that I'm giving today is part of a chapter on translation, which I take also to concerns sort of the global context of hermeneutical experience. So that's the idea. And what I'll do today, uh, I'm going to talk about largely about Gadamer's conception of translation. I think that Gadamer's approach is very interesting and uh, largely convincing, but I think that there's sort of a, he stopped short of himself in my judgment. And so the paper begins by talking about Gadamer, and then I'm going to turn to Derrida to offer sort of a critical intervention 
And then after that, I return back to Godwin. And the thought is that maybe I can rehabilitate or expand some of Godwin's reflections thanks to the intervention that God, uh, Derrida's thought that offers. Okay? So that's the plan. And I think it'll take about 45 minutes. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. That's what I think. Okay. The purpose of this presentation, then, is to consider the contour, or at least one contour, of the responsibility to understand that guides our experience of ourselves as part of the global community. Specifically, I focus on the responsibility that Godmer suggests we have to foster a robust global culture of translation. Certainly, Godmer's call for this speaks to what may be called a crisis in the culture of translation in the Anglophone world. In her recent book, Why Translation Matters, Edith Grossman, master translator of Spanish literature into English, including the translation of Don Quixote we just looked at in class, by the way, uh, she lays out the evidence of crisis in no uncertain terms. She writes, the sad statistics indicate that in the US and the UK, for example, only two or three percent of books published each year are literary translations. In Western European nations and Latin America, by contrast, the number is anywhere from 25 to 40 percent. Grossman's observation reminds us of the recent indictment of US literary culture by Horace Engdahl, the permanent secretary of the Nobel Prize jury. The US, Engdahl states, is too isolated, too insular. They don't translate enough, and they don't really participate in the big dialogue of literature. Even if we suspect that Ingdahl's assessment is tinged by hyperbole, or even ressentiment, as some American literary critics have suggested, we nevertheless recognize the scope and depth of the political, social, and humanistic stakes of the crisis of translation in the Anglophone world readily. And again, I'm just going to allow Grossman to state it. Translation, she says, not only plays an important traditional role as the means that follow the means that allow us to access literature originally written in one of the countless languages we can't read, but, is also, but it also represents a concrete literary presence with the crucial capacity to ease and make more meaningful our relationships to those with whom we may not have had a connection before. Translation always helps us to know, to see from a different angle, to attribute new value to what once may have been unfamiliar. As nations and individuals, we have a critical need for that kind of understanding and insight. The alternative is unthinkable. So if we are called to understand ourselves in a global context, as Gautamer suggests that we are, then the need for a robust global culture of translation is not a marginal concern, but of decisive significance. The focus of the current presentation is to consider the contribution that Gautamer's philosophical hermeneutics makes to our concern to foster such a culture. Yet in this, as we shall see, Godamer confronts us with an apparent dilemma. On the one hand, he clarifies the stakes of and makes a strong case for the claim that we have a responsibility to translate. On the other hand, however, Godamer also maintains that the task of the translator itself results in continual resignation because every translation is, as he says, like a betrayal of the original text. In this presentation, I maintain that this dilemma can be resolved because Godamer's second claim his conclusion that the task of translation ends in renunciation rests on a confusion. Building on a claim made by Derrida, Jacques Derrida in a related context, I argue that Gadamer's conclusion relies on the questionable assumption that we experience our primary language with a privileged intimacy that is only diminished in our experience of translated texts. In view of this criticism drawn from Derrida, I seek to rehabilitate Gadamer's approach recommending that the task of translation need not result in continual resignation, excuse me, renunciation, but can, on the contrary, lead to an increase in our possibilities to understand and interpret. And with that, I'm going to evoke his celebrated idea of an increase in being that can be achieved through artworks and talk about that in the uh, context of translation. So that's the thought for the paper. Um, there are going to be three sections. In the first, I'll talk about Gadamer's idea of translation, then I'll turn to Derrida, and then I'll turn back to Gadamer. So here's the first section. Gadamer, in his later essays, lectures, and interviews, maintains that our potential to address the global, political, social, and economic challenges we face has increasingly been put into jeopardy by the now nearly ubiquitous use <laughs> out of my watch. Mm -hmm. the, let me, I'm sorry. Gadamer, in his later essays, lectures, and interviews, maintains mm -hmm. that our potential to address the global, political, social, and economic challenges we face has increasingly been put into jeopardy by the now nearly ubiquitous use of what may be called calculative rationality to manage all human relations. By calculative rationality, 
Gadamer has in mind the vision of reason achieved in the early modern period that is guided by modern scientific method, mathematical quantification, and that has led to our remarkable technological manipulation of natural conditions, and more and more in our times, also of societal life. With this, the jeopardy we are put in has reached worldwide proportions as calculative rationality increasingly becomes the standard of societal organization and administration, no less on a global scale than on national, regional, local, and institutional scales. Godber maintains that our acceptance of the calculative management of all aspects of human relations results in a condition of anonymity that threatens to foreclose our possibilities to make one another visible in the exteriority of our respective differences and singularities. In consequence of this anonymity, our potential to work together to address the global challenges we face, and indeed, even our potential to become visible enough to one another that we may work together at all, stands under threat. So, in his later writings, Godwin becomes very interested in a notion of global solidarity. And for him, the master key uh, for the achievement, or for the pursuit of global solidarity, is an intervention against uh, this anonymity, uh, calculative rationality, that allows us to become visible to one another in our respective situations and thereby our vulnerabilities and needs so that we can begin to work together politically. Uh, it is more than an intervention against our acceptance of the regime of calculative rationality that Gadamer calls for us to recognize the factically given diversity of languages from across the globe as a treasure trove of meaning with the potential to teach us about one another and with this about multiple and varied perspectives on the human condition. In a public lecture from 1990, he writes, my concern is to show that it is our task not simply to want to organize away the diversity of languages through rationalization and bureaucratization, but rather for each of us to learn to bridge and fill in the distances and oppositions between us. And this means that we respect, care for, and protect others. And especially, he says, to give one another always a new hearing. It's kind of a lovely term of phrase. If we are to address the global challenges we face, it is Godmer's belief, we will have to cut against the current of calculative rationality and learn again to hear one another from out of the context of the cacophony of languages that we find across the globe. Moreover, Godmer's intervention against the regime of calculative rationality comes into focus on the global diversity of languages because this diversity encompasses, safeguards, and calls us to recognize the bequests of meaning that will allow us to become visible to one another in connection with our respective linguistic and cultural heritages. Godmer, in view of the jeopardy that he believes the regime of calculative rationality to represent, compares proponents of calculative rationality to the people who settled in, uh, settled in the, the biblical city of Babel. He asserts that his intervention against the regime of calculative rationality calls for, quote, precisely the opposite of what the story of Babel presents as the delusional ideal of the people there. The idea there was, let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we shall be scattered abroad across the earth. What kind of name is this, then, in which we want to stay together? Is it, he says, it is the name that one has and that allows one, so to speak, no longer to listen to the other. The analogy that Gautamer draws is clear enough. For its proponents, the regime of calculative rationality promises a universal language whose intelligibility transcends the diversity of factically given languages from across the globe. This is a promise, as might be said with the biblical story, of a world in which, quote, the whole earth would have one language and the same words. That's Genesis 11. 11. Whereas proponents of the regime of calculative rationality may advocate for the sameness, the uniformity, regularity, and efficiency that would result from such universal intelligibility, Gadamer, for his part, suggests that the regime of calculative rationality is oriented by a flight from our responsibility to understand one another in our diversity of differences and respective singularity. <clears throat> He argues, by contrast, that this responsibility to understand one another calls us to become open to and develop our aptitude for the plurality of meaning that confronts us from out of the global diversity of languages and their religious, juridical, and literary bequests. Even as Gadamer calls for us, so that's his motivation for thinking about a responsibility to, under, to understand, a responsibility to translate. But even as Gadamer calls for us to recognize the treasure trove of meaning that is represented by the global diversity of languages, however, he nevertheless despairs of the finitude that this diversity entails. Gadamer argues that the possibility of translation, the very condition of our access to the vast majority of texts from the diverse languages across the globe, are finite 
because translation never carries a text over from its original language without remainder. Compared to the text in the original language, he thinks, the translated text remains always deficient, impoverished, and lacking. In his 1989 essay, Reading is Like Translating, Gomer asserts that the finitude of translation is so severe that translation should always be regarded in terms of betrayal. He writes, a celebrated word of Benedito Croce says, traditori, traditori. Every translation is like a betrayal. But what, however, does Godmar mean by this claim, that every translation is like a betrayal? He maintains that every translation is guided by a purpose that no translation can achieve. On the one hand, he argues that the purpose of every translation is to conserve the meaning of the original text. On the other hand, however, no translation can achieve this purpose without remainder. Godmar, in this latter belief that no translation does justice to its original, he is, of course, hardly saying something novel. Yet Godmar's elucidation of his claim is instructive. He maintains that no translation conserves the meaning of the original without remainder because every language comprises a unique context of meaning. Language, grasped as such, therefore shapes the meaning of every text comprised from it. Indeed, not only every text, but also every word. In order for a translator to conserve the meaning of an original text, then, she must not only first interpret the manner in which the language or context of, it, of meaning of the original text shapes the meaning of the text. I didn't say that well. I'll try that one more time. Uh, in order for a translator to conserve the meaning of an original text, then, she must not only first interpret the manner in which the language or context of meaning of the original text shapes the meaning of that text, but must then in turn attempt to recreate this shape within a language that provides not the same, but rather an irreducibly different context of meaning. Give me the quotation of the drink. So he thinks that the uh, text has to be recreated in the target language. And he writes, here, the translator must translate the meaning to be understood into the context in which the other speaker lives. This does not, of course, mean that he is at liberty to falsify the meaning of what the other person says. Rather, the meaning must be preserved, but since it must be understood within a new language world, it must establish its validity within it in an entirely new way. Because the context that shapes the meaning of the original text is always irreducibly different from the context of the translated text, the translator's attempt to conserve the meaning of the original cannot turn on correspondence to the original, but must rather constitute the meaning of the text in a novel way from out of the possibilities and limits of meaning that the language of the translated text provides. In consequence, Godmar argues that translations are in fact the result first of a translator's interpretation of the text that only second is carried over into the language of the translated text. The irreducible difference between languages, as Godmar puts it, results in, quote, a gap that can never be completely closed. So Godmar holds that every translation is like a betrayal because what the translated text remainders from the original is not a depreciation or loss, but rather a mutation of the original text that he understands as a distortion. A translator, in first interpreting the original text and then carrying over this interpretation into another language, does not simply leave out, neglect, or exclude some parts or aspects of the meaning of the original, but instead recreates the text in a novel context. This, however, involves an axial shift in which the meaning of the text as a whole takes on another shape. This axial shift, no matter how great or small, comprises a mutation of the arrangement of meanings found in the original. Thus, if no translation conserves the meaning of the original without remainder, this is not due to omissions, but rather changes that render the translation, however slightly, an imposter. With this, Godmar concludes that the finitude to which we are exposed in the experience of translation leads to renunciation. Godmar, as we have seen, calls for us to combat the increasingly planetary reign of calculative rationality in no small part through the recognition of the treasure trove of meaning that is represented by the global diversity of languages and the religious, juridical, and literary requests. Yet his considerations of the limitations of translation suggest that, suggest that these riches remain always just beyond our reach. Of the translator, he writes, since he is always in the position of not really being able to express all the dimensions of the text, he must make a constant renunciation. So 
those are maybe some of the basics on the landscape of the way Godmar thinks about translation. And I thought I would lay those out. And uh, in having done that, I'd like to turn Derrida on and talk about him for a little bit. Okay? Um, this, the first section was called Godamer on Translation. This is called On the Example of Derrida. And I focus in a little bit on his work in the Tower of Babel text, but especially on this really lovely text called The Monolinguism of the Other. I mean, if you haven't read it, it's really interesting. So Derrida. Although the prospects to resolve the dilemma that Godmar's considerations of translation present are no doubt many, one of the most illuminative can be drawn from some of Derrida's reflections on the experience of translation. That's what I propose. Derrida, even more than Godmar, elucidates his conception of translation with reference to the biblical story of Babel, Tower of Babel. For Derrida, too, the stakes of any consideration of translation are foremost political, social, and ethical. Accordingly, in his essay on the Tower of Babel, Derrida observes, first of all, that the story of the Tower of Babel offers a cautionary tale about the will to hegemony, to perfection, finality, and purity. Whether this will is grasped, as in Godmar, as a matter of calculative rationality, or otherwise. Through God's punishment, Derrida suggests, the story of uh, the Tower of Babel, quote, exhibits an incompletion, the impossibility of finishing, totalizing, or saturating, of completing something on the order of an, edif uh, an edifice, architectural construction, system, and architectonics. Whereas Derrida's point here is thus compatible or comparable to uh, Gadamer's approach to the biblical story, Derrida furthermore stresses, however, that the story cautions against the will to hegemony as this will guides imperial or colonial ambition in particular. Derrida argues that if God's punishment of the residents of Babel was certainly, quote, for wanting to accede to the highest up to the most high, the punishment was directed specifically at their hubris for wanting to make a name for themselves. So again, he focuses on that same passage that Godmer did. But in contrast with Godmer, Derrida interprets this desire of those in Babel to make a name for themselves as a will to assert their own identity as a nation or a people, not only through the establishment of the purity of their unique genealogy, but moreover, through the assertion of the universality of the rationality embodied in their language. In this, God's punishment rails against the political violence that their desire for identity implies. He writes, in seeking a name for themselves, to found at the same time a universal tongue and a unique genealogy, the Semites want to bring the world to reason, and this reason can signify simultaneously a colonial violence, since they would thus universalize their idiom, but also a peaceful transparency of the human community if they succeed. Inversely, when God imposes and opposes his name, he ruptures the rational transparency, but it, uh, excuse me, yeah, he ruptures the rational transparency, but interrupts also the colonial violence or the linguistic imperialism. Here, as Derrida stresses, the will to assert a universal language, or perhaps better, a language that makes a claim to universal rationality, leads to the desire to impose as universal something that is, in fact, always only one among others. Derrida believes that the cautionary tale represented by the biblical story of the Tower of Babel is of utmost pertinence in our post-colonial era. In his writing, Monolinguism of the Other, or the Prothesis of the Origin, he maintains that the European powers of the colonial period exhibited a will to impose their identity with no less imperial zeal than the biblical residents of Babel. He elucidates the European powers' will to impose their identities on the world, not through a general history of the colonial period, however, but rather on the example of his personal history as a colonial and post-colonial subject of France from the Maghrebian region, an area that today encompasses Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. Of the many ways that the French imposed their identity as a people in this region, in any case, Derrida focuses on what he refers to as an interdict. In fact, ultimately not only legal, but also cultural, by which the French imposed their language through their colonial educational apparatus to the exclusion of the local Arabic, Berber, as well as, in Derrida's case, Hebrew. He describes this interdict as a, quote, monolinguism imposed by the other, which operated, quote, through a sovereignty whose essence is always colonial, which tends repressively and irrepressibly to reduce language to the one. In consequence of this French colonial interdict, Derrida found himself as a young pu pupil in a school that was part of the colonial educational apparatus, and thus, that led him to acquire French as his primary language. 
Yet he reports that he did at the same time, and continues throughout his life, to experience the French language with an acute sense of alienation. As he describes this uh, alienation in, in, in what are surely the most celebrated turns of phrase from the essay, he says, in consequence of this upbringing, this interdict, I have only one language, it is not my own. It's really beautiful I mean, and powerful turn of phrase. And that becomes kind of a leitmotif of this piece. Derrida suggests that general lessons about language, and as we shall see, especially about translation, can be drawn from the example of his own experience of language as a colonial subject. In this, he characterizes his own life experience as, quote, an exceptional situation, uh, but nevertheless one that is, quote, exemplary of universal structures of our experience of language. Specifically, uh, he maintains that his experience of the French language exposes as a pretense what I shall refer to here as the myth of the mother tongue. By this myth, I mean the idea that our primary language is so much our own that by the time we reach the age of maturity at least, we no longer need to acquire, adopt, or appropriate it, experiencing our primary language instead with the intimacy of something naturally given. On the basis of this myth, we take our relation to our primary language to be no less intimate, embodied, or naturally given than the relationship of child to mother. Yet if Derrida's experience of the French language exemplifies a universal structure, then our relation to our primary language, or as he puts it, our only language, the only language we experience as our primary language, then our relation to this primary language is never as intimate or naturally given than, uh, as the myth of the mother tongue purports. Derrida writes, the language called maternal is never purely natural, not proper, nor inhabitable, to inhabit. This is a value that is quite disconcerting and uh, equivocal. One never inhabits what one is in the habit of calling inhabited. There is no possible habitat without the difference of this exile. Despite all pretenses of familiarity, we are never fully at home within, uh, within even our primary language. Our relation to our primary language never carries the intimacy of something naturally given but rather remains always uncanny, at once seemingly hospitable, and yet at the same time also hostile in its exteriority. I don't do anything with this in this paper, but uh, Derrida uh, develops this uncanny sense of one's primary language with reference to his notion of hospitality or his approach to it, uh, in which he thinks that you know, something that we experience as hospitable, as uh, uh, familiar, can at the same time pull us hostage and be hostile to us. Derrida's elucidation of the universal structure of language that he believes to be exemplified in his experience of language as a colonial and later post-colonial subject illuminates not only the logic of colonial violence, however. His elucidation also sheds light on the experience of translation. He recognizes that discussions of translation characteristically assume, whether overtly or tacitly, the myth of the mother tongue. Within discussions such as these, Translation is taken to concern the transfer of a text, or in any case, a piece of writing or speech, from a language relatively unfamiliar to us into the intimacy of our naturally given language. Derrida's assertion that he has only one language that is nevertheless not his own recommends, by contrast, that we experience no such privilege of intimacy in our primary language. In view of this, we face the task of translation not only in our counters with a text, a piece of writing or speech from a language relatively unfamiliar to us, but even in our efforts to listen and read, speak and write in our primary language. Derrida describes the challenge that thus confronts us, both in our relation to another language and our primary language, as a task of what he calls absolute translation. <laughs> By this, he means that we find ourselves always abandoned to the task of translation, but without recourse to any firm linguistic ground that we could call our own. He writes that the task of absolute translation is, quote, without a pole of reference, without an originary language, and without a source language. Mm -hmm. Faced with the challenge of absolute translation, he says, there are only target languages, if you will. It's a lovely turn of phrase, kind of, you know, within translation studies, the source languages of the original, the target language is the one that is to be translated into. He says, in fact, there are only target languages. Really impressive idea, or powerful idea. Derrida thus argues that all we although we find ourselves always already immersed in language, such language is never originally and indeed can never completely be made our own. He writes, there is no given language, or rather there is some language, a gift of language, a gift die Sprache, but there is not a language, not a given 
It does not exist. Like a charge, it remains to be given. It remains only on this condition by still remaining to be given. If the myth of the mother tongue purports that the intimacy of our primary language has always already been achieved, is always already behind us, then Derrida, by contrast, upholds that our primary language remains always to come, ahead of us. Immersed in language, this language is never yet our own. In Derrida's displacement of the myth of the mother tongue, we find ourselves rather always and again exposed interminably to the exteriority of the language we desire to acquire, adopt, and create. So those are some of the thoughts on the way that Derrida talks about translation, at least in this piece on uh, the monolinguism of the other. He talks about translation in many places, but um, and, uh, although I believe they're ultimately compatible, you know, uh, um, that, that would take some work. So I just want to focus on this particular idea. And um, this leads me kind of to the last section of the paper, which is sort of where the argument's supposed to happen. And I call this with and against Godmar. Derrida's reflections on translation provide, I believe, an impetus to resolve the dilemma with which Gadamer's considerations present us. Gadamer, as we have seen, on the one hand recognizes our responsibility to foster a robust global culture of translation. Yet, on the other hand, he argues that the task of translation, itself our principal prospect to pursue our responsibility to make one another visible from within the context of this diversity, ends always in renunciation. In consequence, Godmer's considerations appear to leave us suspended between responsibility and renunciation, between the call to make ourselves visible to one another through translation and the disavowal to which this call inevitably leads. Derrida's reflections point us to a resolution of this apparent dilemma, I think because they suggest that Godmer's giving in to the renunciation rests on a confusion. In view of this, this is the idea, we are able to return to Godmer's philosophical hermeneutics to consider this conclusion that Godmer reaches. As we shall see, Godmer's recognition of the responsibility to translate need not result in renunciation, but instead may lead to an increase in the being of the original, and even to the possibilities to understand and interpret that belong uh, to the language into which the translation of the original is introduced. So the thought is that somehow uh, I would like to demonstrate that uh, Derrida's reflections can help us uh, begin to rethink Gadamer and rehabilitate Gadamer's thought. Derrida's reflections on translation then provide the impetus for us to reconsider the validity of Gadamer's conclusion that the task of uh, translation results in renunciation. <coughs> in this, Gadamer's conclusion appears to follow not simply from his claim that every translation is like a betrayal, even to the point of untranslatability. Rather, his conclusion appears to derive before all else from a comparison between the experience of the translation of a text from an unfamiliar language and the interpretation of a text within one's primary language. If for Gadamer, translation leads to renunciation, this seems to be not because translation is like a betrayal per se, but rather because our experience of such betrayal compares poorly to the fidelity he believes to be possible for our interpretation of text in the primary language. Derrida's reflection suggests that Gadamer's conclusion is invalid, however, because this comparison rests on something like the myth of the mother tongue. For as Derrida believes his experience of language to exemplify, <laughs> languages unfamiliar to us are, in essence, not any less intimacy, intimate, not any less naturally given than our primary language. In both instances, we experience language as something that remains to be appropriated, or as Derrida also expresses this, we, remain them, we experience them all as target languages. Thus, while every translation is like a betrayal, this betrayal is, in essence, never any greater um, than it is in our interpretation of a text in our primary language, or for that matter, in any of our attempts to listen or read, speak or write. To the extent that Godmer's conclusion follows from his comparison of the experience of translation with that of the interpretation of a text in our primary language then, it seems he really has no more reason to associate translation with renunciation than he does to do so with any other hermeneutical experience. That's my thought. Derrida's reflections may therefore be understood to recommend that we pursue an alternative to the conclusion that Gadamer asserts. One alternative, to be sure, is simply to adopt Derrida's conclusion that all translation, like all interpretation, 
requires us to engage in a language as a language of the other that is always still to arrive. If we are convinced at all by Gautamer's concern that we make one another visible within the global context of the diversity of our respective linguistic traditions, however, we may worry that Derrida's approach will be of too little help. For if translation, and indeed all interpretation, remains always still to arrive, then the contributions that a translation can make to the visibility of another will remain always in deferral. But I think another alternative in any case is to read with Gadamer himself, to look elsewhere within his philosophical hermeneutics in order to read again <coughs> his own conclusion that translation ends in renunciation. In pursuit of this alternative, I wish to take up Gadamer's claim from a different but nevertheless related context that artworks embody what he calls an increase in the being of their original subject matter. With this, we shall see that translation does not end in renunciation, but instead to an increase, both in the being of the original and in the possibilities to understand and interpret that belong to the language of the translated text. So that's the thought. Gadamer elucidates his claim that artworks comprise an increase in the being of their original subject matter in truth and method, in his discussion of the ontology of the artwork generally, and in what he calls the ontological valence of the picture in particular, that is, the painting or artistic image. There, he maintains that although the being of pictures remains essentially tied to the originals they portray, pictures are not dependent in their being on the originals. The being of pictures is not that of a representation, reproduction, or copy, which is characteristically taken to be derived from and also a diminution of the original. Instead, he argues, that the being of the picture is autonomous in that it comprises an increase in the being of the original. By this, he means that the picture presents, with us, uh, presents us with meanings that characterize the original, or as Godmar puts the point without fanfare, the picture says something about the original. As such, the picture comprises an overflow, an emanation, he even says, of the original because the picture makes explicit meaning of the original that otherwise remains implicit within it. Gautamer maintains that there is no upper limit to this increase in being. No picture, or for that matter, accumulation of pictures, can completely exhaust the meaning of the original. Rather, every picture of the original, as long as it succeeds, further draws out the meaning of the original. The being of the picture, far from derivative, is rather an overflow of meaning that allows the original to become ever more, uh, as Gautamer puts it, presented as it is. Gadamer's elucidation of the ontological valence of the picture recommends that the task of translation result not in renunciation, but rather in an increase in being. Gadamer, as we have seen, maintains that every translation is like a betrayal. With this, he implies that every translation comprises a mutation of the meaning of the original and not merely a depreciation or loss. Yet, why can't this mutation itself be understood as an increase? This mutation appears to involve an increase of being in at least two ways. First, a translation may be grasped as an increase in the being of the original text. By this, I mean that a translation can comprise an overflow that makes explicit uh, aspects of the meaning of the original that remain otherwise only implicit. Um, as John Salas has argued in his really fine book on translation, Gadamer himself all but suggests this much. In Truth and Method, Gadamer observes that because every translation builds on a prior interpretation of the original, translations can, quote, highlight features of the text that remain more or less inconspicuous in the original. In Reading is Like Translating, he complements this idea, arguing that a translation can represent a gain, as he says, for the interpretation of the text, insofar as it, quote, increases our understanding of the clarity and coherence of the original, thus giving emphasis, contour, or accent to aspects of the original. Like the being of a picture, the being of a translation, too, comprises an overflow that makes explicit meaning otherwise only implicit, that makes explicit meaning otherwise only implicit in the original. And moreover, just as no picture or accumulation of pictures exhausts the meaning of the original, neither does any translation or accumulation of translations exhaust the original. Rather, translation poses an infinite task of bringing out what the original says. There is, moreover, I think, a second manner in which translation represents an increase in being. Gadamer recognizes that language, grasped as a context of meaning that grants possibilities to understand and interpret, shapes the text composed from out of it. Yet conversely, language too is likewise shaped by the introduction of novel texts, or for that matter, novel relations of meaning in any form. 
A language, too, undergoes an axial shift, however slight, when such texts or novel relations of meaning are introduced. If a translation comprises an overflow of the meaning of the original, and never simply a distortion or depreciation of the original, then translations, too, can infuse the language into which they have been carried over uh, without, with new novelty. In consequence, languages can undergo an increase in their possibilities to understand and interpret with the introduction of new translations. Translations represent the possibility not only of an increase in the being of the original text then, but moreover, an increase in linguistic possibilities in general. Okay, so I just want to offer a brief conclusion, but that's sort of the nub of the argument. Um, and I just have about a page or so to go here. Got him. Not only in Truth and Method, but in a number of later essays, asserts that his project of philosophical hermeneutics both takes inspiration as well as critical distance from the romantic hermeneutics of the 19th century figure Friedrich Schleiermacher. It seems that the same may be argued of Gadamer's rehabilitated conclusion about translation. I take myself to try to rehabilitate what he just said here, thanks to Derrida, so that's what I'm gonna call it in conclusion. So it seems that the same, uh, that he has both the kind of inspiration from and critical distance from Schleiermacher can also be said of Gadamer's rehabilitated conclusion about translation. For on the one hand, Gadamer's rehabilitated conclusion that translation can lead to an increase in being may be said to echo Schleiermacher's belief that a robust culture of translation can not only contribute to our interpretation of original texts, but also, especially for Schleiermacher, enrich the language into which the text is translated. In a call Schleiermacher makes to foster such a culture in the context of his contemporary Germany, Schleiermacher asserts, just as our soil has probably become richer and more fertile, our climate more lovely and mild after much transplanting of foreign plants, so do we feel that our language, which we practice less because of our Nordic lethargy, can only flourish and develop its own perfect power through the most varied contacts with what is foreign. So notwithstanding Schleiermacher's perhaps now outdated knowledge of agricultural science and climatology, the point of his analogy is that a primary language expands through the infusion of other languages that such translation provides. So I think Gadamer is inspired by that side of Schleiermacher. Yet there is also a difference between Gadamer's rehabilitated conclusion and Schleiermacher's position. Whereas Schleiermacher's perspective appears to be animated by nationalism and even cultural imperialism, Goddard's approach focuses on openness to the global, global context. For as Schleiermacher asserts, and this is the side that Goddard, I think, has critical distance from, Schleiermacher asserts, our nation, the German nation, seems destined, because of its respect for things foreign, and because of its disposition toward mediation, to carry all the treasures of foreign art and scholarship, together with its own, in its language, to, not, to unite them into a great historical whole, as it were, which would be kept safe in the center and heart of Europe. Gadamer's rehabilitated considerations indicate, by contrast, that our responsibility to foster a robust global culture of translation turns not on the establishment of a center into which all treasures from the global context of linguistic traditions may be gathered. Instead, this responsibility is really a call for us to decenter ourselves, to undergo a displacement by which we are removed from the possibilities to understand and interpret familiar to us from our primary language, so that we may, in turn, begin to replace, to place ourselves again in a broader global context of the diversity of our own, excuse me, of our linguistic traditions. In other words, in a context that will allow us to encounter one another in our respective otherness. Thank you. <clears throat>